Okay, the people who are going to the debate tonight have met and agreed to certain rules, and the rules are as follows. Follows. The opening, uh, uh, Ed Goldberg, the gentleman over here will go first. Each of the speakers are entitled to present their position in 20 minutes. I will keep time. After the 20 minutes, after the 20 minutes, to turn on the video, we'll be given five minutes to but or to the video is on whatever the other speaker has said yeah. thereafter if you're still awake and it's not too late <laughs> we will have some questions from the uh, audience please there will be no uh, insults hurled at any of the debaters if any of it starts i will stop it no sound your questions must me or them comments that any of the debaters must be in the form of the question. Yeah. Thirty participants in the video. We'll have three minutes to deliver your question. Okay. Um. Now, if uh, this format, if you like this format, you feel you want to do this again. No one is talking. Yeah. Please. Sound is on. Dear Dave and myself, no. We'll arrange for a debate on the topic. And if you don't like it, please let us know also. Very uh, people are on the video. Goldberg, Ed is a long term resident of uh, the village. He happens to live in Ainsley. No sound. I think they just said you need to mute the, the participants. He happens to live in Ainsley. Turn on the video sound. sound. In, in the street. They're saying there's no and sound. Ed will be taking the side okay. and going first that the Times is, in fact, anti-Semitic. No, 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 no. Stanley will go second. Okay, Stanley spent his, most of his working career. Oh, no, now I lost. Oh. Working for the New York Times. And of course he will be presenting the position that the Times is not anti-Semitic. So please give them the, your ultimate respect. Please no personal comments. I will be keeping time. I will let each of the speakers know when there is one minute left of their 20 minutes. Okay. Hi, my name is Ed Goldberg. By the way, if you are here to hear me say that the New York Times is biased, you're in the wrong place. Well, biased, biased is a very weak word. <laughs> the New York Times is taken totally 100% anti-Semitic in their essence, in their core, and even criminally, even criminally. Now, let me, I will talk about three different specifics when it comes to that. <laughs> That's a total surprise. I can't believe she did that. Anyway, okay, let's talk about anti Semitism and anti Zionism. If you remember, some of you remember here about 500 years ago when what it meant to be uh, an anti Semite was that they were all against our religion. And if you converted, you weren't thrown out of the country 500 years ago in Spain or whatever. A few years, centuries later, it was no longer religion. It was the programs, and if you don't belong in that country, you should get your own country, anti-Semitism. A few years after that, race. Remember, race became, you were a Jew no matter what, even though your great-great-grandfather was the only Jew in your family, your race is Jewish, and therefore I'm going to kill you. Anti-Semitism. Now that we have a home country, or a country, Zionism is the new word for anti-Semitism. Now, if you don't believe me, look at what's happened. First of all, Congress voted a year ago, 311 to 14, that Zionism and anti-Semitism is the same thing. Now, when you see all these 
Buchner's walking in the campus in Harvard with their yarmulkes and their tzitzes hanging out. And these, these Palestinian demonstrators attack them. They don't ask them first, oh, before I attack you, are you a Zionist? Because to them, as to the rest of the world, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Same thing. Who am I to say, no, 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 you can be an anti-Zionist, but that doesn't mean you're anti-Semitic. You are. Second item, op-eds. If you, look, if you ever look at the op-eds of the New York Times, it is anything talking about, that talks about Jews is predominantly, predominantly anti-Semitic. Now you can say, well, op-eds have nothing to pay, but they do. They do. If, if it's the predominantly anti-Semitic, every single article about Jews is anti-Semitic, that's the core and the essence of the newspaper. That is what they stand for. Because they chose the people that attend or that write for the op-ed. So there's no difference. The op-ed page in the New York Times starts on page one and ends at the end of the opinion page, closer to the crossword puzzles. Okay, third item, and this is the basis for my entire discussion. It's a premise. New York Times is anti-Semitic. They hire predominantly people whose profile history is anti-Semitic. These people write articles that meet their profile, anti-Semitic. And that fits the total narrative of the New York Times, anti-Semitism. I will show you the, or talk to you about who the people they hire, their history, and I'll sprinkle it with a few articles. Now, I am going to just mention very short, uh, concisely, some of the articles. I don't want to get into a lot of detail. And I'll tell you what in a second. First of all, you remember the article of the bombing of the hospital in Gaza that was blamed on Israel? You remember three, four years ago, the uh, IDF person who was told or was shown as beating up a Palestinian kid in Mount, in the Temple Mount? Well, the Palestinian kid was a Jew who was studying in Israel, an American Jew studying in Israel. Temple Mount wasn't Temple Mount, and the IDF was protecting the kid from all the Palestinian demonstrators. They got it slightly wrong. Okay, another one is you remember the photo that uh, a cartoon where the Netanyahu was leading a dog called Trump by the leash, and what that uh, what that showed. I'm not going to talk about that. And I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, there's also three events that happened, three events in one day. One event in New York, a teacher was being harassed, harangued, threatened by students, a Jewish person who was pro-Israel. Second event, the Palestinian demonstrators broke into, broke into a kosher restaurant. Third event, three, and that was in New York. Third event, three Palestinians were shot at in Vermont. Well, to be fair, New York Times had three articles. Unfortunately, all three were about the Vermont person being shot. They forgot. They forgot about the two events that happened to New York Jews. Well, let me tell you, the reason I'm not belaboring that is because, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I mean, so what? They put it in the front page, big pictures. Well, it was a mistake. They only have 5,900 employees. 5,900. But, you know, not all of them are journalists, research people, uh, op-ed people, maybe only a thousand. I don't know what the number is. I, I'm sure standing there. Maybe only a thousand. They don't have the time to take one or two of those journals and say, look at the front page. Tell me if those are, that page is factual. They don't want to waste time, you know, look. So you got to believe one or two things. Either the New York Times is very, very sloppy in their writing, but they make mistakes all the time, or 
they're purposefully anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist. You choose. Stanley may believe they're smart. I believe they're just mamish anti-Semitics. So let's go back to the premise circle. Okay. In the beginning, in the beginning of the New York Times was 1896, Ox bought the newspaper. It was Jewish, reformed Jew. One of his main fears was, since he was Jewish, that the New York Times would be viewed as a Jewish paper. So he made, he did everything he possibly could to make sure that nobody knew that. Very few stories, very few items about Jews were mentioned in the Times. He then uh, gave the newspaper to his son-in-law, Arthur Schlossberg, a very big name. I'm just calling, I'm just going to call him the Big Ass. It's a shorter name. Anyway, he was mamish worse than the original guy. He said, quote, we must ensure the word Jew would no longer be a common denominator for activities where Jews are the main participants. You understand that? Don't mention Jews, even Jews, even though Jews were the main participants. I don't understand that. To prove that he didn't want the word Jews mentioned a lot, during World War II, there were, there were 11,500 articles in the front page about World War II. Out of those 11,500, I'm reading this specifically because I don't want to be like the New York Times and quote you wrong facts. So I got real facts. Out of the 11,500, six, six were about the Holocaust. Point zero five. Percent. And by the way, none of those said Jews in the front page, in the front office. None of them. After all, uh, the big ass believed that Jews shouldn't be mentioned, even though they're highly they're participating in the in the uh, event. His quote was 1946 after the war. Thousands of Jews that died might be alive today, might be alive today, if it wasn't for the Jewish Zionist feelings. So in other words, he believed, quote, European Jews were responsible for their own demise. They were responsible for the Holocaust. That's what the New York Times, the publisher, the owner believed that. Okay. He also said, ah, you know, Jews were they, Jews were just a minor percentage of the people displaced in the war. Minor percentage. Okay. A famous writer, Gay Thales, I'm sure I'm using I'm saying the word wrong, Thales, whatever it is. Thales, Thales, said, quote, the New York Times does not want to be viewed as a Jewish paper and will bend over backwards to prove the point forcing itself at times into unnatural, contorted positions. Couldn't say it better. Couldn't say it better. There were three main people in the Berlin Bureau, New York Times people, in the Berlin Bureau uh, during the war, during the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They were Bechold, Tolach, Jacques and then there's, I don't want to pronounce their name, there's a shul, believe me, they're not worth pronouncing the, the name right. Two of them were born in the United States in a town that was mainly German that had demonstrations for the Nazis before the uh, United States got into the war. So I'm going to quote some of the things they wrote in the paper. Not op-eds. Journalists wrote this in the paper. First, well, before I do that, let me tell you uh, two more facts. In the Bureau, the only Bureau uh, that had uh, in, in uh, Berlin. They flew the Nazi flag in the building that the New York Times owned. The Nazi flag flew, you know, with the swastika and all that. That's probably not anti Semitic, it's a mistake. Uh, they also permitted their employees to, to march in the May Day celebration, celebrating Hitler. So what? Freedom of expression. 
So one of the biggest news articles that came out in 19 in 2020 in 1924 was quote at written in the New York Times. Very good prognosis, but not sufficient. Quote, after Hitler gets out of prison in 2024, Hitler's behavior in prison convinced me that he will be no longer with, will be feared and he will go into early retirement. That's what they wrote. 36 Olympics, they wrote nothing. I, the writer, substanti found substantiated the race persecution occurred in the Olympics. They praised the diversity of the Olympics, while other papers said hate and fear are blowing hard at the Olympic flame. That was another paper. And there is articles are really telling. Wow. Quote, Hitler is threatening radical Nazis and getting them out of the party. Why? Plus, Hitler has put a curve on zealous Nazis. Another quote, the German government would not tolerate persecution of the Jews. Quoted by Enderis. And Enderis wrote again and again of Germans' peaceful intentions. There was one person in the newspaper, Irvin, uh, Warren Urban, who pointed out to the big S that the paper is anti-Semitic. The big S threatened to Sue him. And he wrote, Erwin wrote, and Deiris had made no secret of his pro Nazi sympathies, a question the right of the greatest American newspaper in the world to maintain a pro Nazi as a chief correspondent in Berlin. The big ass did nothing. Well, when the United States got into the war, uh, Germany took all the uh, reporters from the United States and put them in a concentration hotel. They were only able to go see stories or to, uh, write about stories with a Gestapo agent next to them. Everyone except Endiris. Endiris was given free reign, lived in a luxury hotel because the Nazi official said he is 100% our friend. Sure, a Nazi. At the end of the war, 1945, Endiris said, too bad. Germany lost the war. Too bad Germany lost the war. However, I have to give the New York Times credit. In 1996, the New York Times admitted they underplayed the politics. That was only 51 years after the war ended. How many years? Okay. Now let's talk about the president, Tariq Barconi, one of the writers. He served as the president of the Palestinian Policy Network. He wrote a book where he condemned Hamas, condemned them for the non-violent pacifism that they were taking. He wanted them to kill Jews. But he had space in the New York Times. He says resistance is acceptable and even notable, noble and desirable. Resistance to him meant killing Jews. Marvin Bargodi, who killed five Israelis, was in prison and was given a space in the New York Times. And the New York Times called them Palace, a Palestinian leader and a parliamentarian killing five Jews. This is a this is unbelievable. A publisher, uh, Professor Alaric, wrote in the New York Times. The New York Times praised him. And on October 7, 2023, he joked because he wanted to know whether an Israeli baby was baked alive with or without baking soap. Is that horrible? I read, I threw up when I read these, read this stories. Michelle Goldberg, not my daughter. Michelle Goldberg is a mamish, a, a journalist in Los Angeles. 100% anti-Zionist, leader of the BDS. Every single article she writes, and there it profuse op-eds, articles, whatever, always anti-Israel, always. Solomon Haiti, 
said another right. I'm showing you how their background makes them call write articles that are the narrative of New York Times. Hygiene, quote, he was hired, by the way, to cover the Israeli Hamas war for the New York Times. Quote, I am in a state of harmony as Hitler was during the Holocaust. This Facebook post next to a picture of Hitler said, how great are you, Hitler? How great? This is the person that was hired by the New York Times. And he was hired twice. The first time a few years ago, then he was fired and he hired again. Patrick Kingsley talked about the rescue of the hostages. Now, I, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But there were two people, two people that were pro-Israel. Barry Weiss, who quit, and she said, in light of my recognition, that the paper of record no longer has room for journalism, journalists who refuse to, to fall in step with the far left and are anti-Semitic in their political narratives, and that is the New York Times Bible. I quit. Very high, highly distinguished uh, woman. Brett Stevens, everybody will bring Brett Stevens. I'm sure that my uh, opponent will talk about Brett Stevens for half, half his time. The model you know, person that, that really ends up showing that he is the exception to the rule, that makes the rule. He said, the Times has a long-standing Jewish problem, continuing to the present day in a form of intensely adversarial co coverage of Israel. He was interviewed in the Ashul, and he was gonna talk about some articles he wrote. He didn't have a chance to talk about the articles because they attacked him. They attacked him vehemently. And he said, I'm not here to defend the New York Times. I am trying to change it. Okay. Now, Mamish, the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst. The worst of the worst. Tom Friedman. Mamish, Tom Friedman is almost a Jew who doesn't say he likes Hitler. He doesn't say, uh, all the other things that make the uh, kid in the oven. He doesn't say that. He comes out of course and says, oh, he's a nice guy. You know, he's a... He was hired from Brandeis College where he belonged to the Middle East Peace Group who was totally 100% anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, same thing. Quotes from him. Palestinian violence resembles the non-lethal mass civil disobedience of America's civil rights struggle. Israel is stuck with an apartheid state distinguished as a disguise as a democracy. The oh, now listen to this. What? The only hope for peace is a complete withdrawal of Israel of Judea, Samaria, East Jerusalem, the Golden Heights. Ed, 20 minutes. Okay. I could go on for about two hours about Tom Friedman. And maybe I'll talk about it later on. But that guy is the worst of the worst. He reminds me of the Kapos in the concentration camp. Jews that push our people to their death. Okay. Thank you, Ed. The next uh, speaker has a uh, very unique position in the shul. He is the chairman of our membership committee. He wanted me to mention that tonight. So if anybody is sitting out there that wants to join the shul, has some problems with their membership, Stanley is the vote to, huh? It's part of the 20 minutes or what? No, this is not part of the 20 minutes. So let me introduce Stanley. I know Stanley more than, longer than I know my wife. I met Stanley over 75 years ago or so. We were bunkmates in camp together, and that's where I knew him. I want to introduce Stanley to you. Please listen to him, Stanley. Your 20 minutes start. Every word and have every word and term has a meaning. And just like you can cannot make up your own facts, you cannot make up your own meanings. And for us in this room. It is especially true for those words that relate to the Jewish experience. 
Words like holocaust, blood libel, even pogrom, have been misused by gentle and Jew alike. These, these misused words usually present a distorted image of the original, but that's okay for them, since it serves their purpose, which is to bring added attention to the issue at hand. So let's take a close look at the term anti-Semitism. What does it really mean? From ChatGBT, the paragon of artificial intelligence, I got this. Anti-Semitism refers to the hostility, prejudice, discrimination against Jews. It is a form of racism. In this case, a person's hostility is driven by the belief that Jews constitute a distinct race with inherent traits or characteristics that are repulsive or inferior to the preferred traits within that person's society. And the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it in much the same way. I want to relate an incident that happened in the mid-1990s. The Times periodically ran a conference for senior newsroom and business there in order for them to get to know each other and to facilitate their working together as a team. It was at a particular dinner that I found myself sitting next to Israeli-born Jack Rosenberg, who at that time was the editorial page editor. Realizing immediately that I was orthodox, the conversation naturally turned to Israel and his editorials. He told me there were three areas where we received letters from both sides complaining about the perceived bias. The first, as you can guess, is the Israeli-Arab conflict. Second is the right to life versus the right to choose, abortion. And the third is gun rights versus gun, gun control versus gun rights. Perhaps there are more now. It's a kid win situation from the start. No matter the coverage, he would get bombarded with letters from both sides complaining on the perceived unfairness. It shows clearly when both parties of a conflict have an all-consuming agenda, there is no way to avoid the perception of bias, no matter how careful or balanced you might think you are. So do, do not think for one second that the Jews are the only victim of the Times' perceived bias. Now let's take a close look at those who accuse the Times of anti-Semitism. Initially, we must acknowledge they are virtually all Jewish, mainly Orthodox for sure, but certainly is a significant percentage for the other denominations and non-affiliated as well. Let us ask ourselves, are these accusers fair-minded? If this were a based in a Jewish court, would any qualify to be a fair-minded judge? I would say no. Are they partial or aidists, unfit to be a witness? I would answer, absolutely. Why are these answers true beyond a reasonable doubt? Because they have an agenda, a bias of their own, if you please. They love Israel in much the same way we love our grandchildren. They are perfect. They can do no wrong. And given that they can do no wrong, every single negative article or opinion written in the Times about Israel is always considered to be biased, regardless whether it's true or false. Therefore, in their mind, these articles are in the paper for some nefarious reason. We must ask, how do these Times bishops know so much about what the Times writes? Do they actually read the paper? There are a few ways. A small minority actually are Times readers, very few. Or they once were Times readers and canceled, more than just one. They are, all, they are also those who receive selected Times articles, like from like-minded friends or relatives, that put Israel and Jews in a negative light, but they never receive any that put them in a positive light. I know that Ed often gets his information that way because he told me so. There are, then there are those who get all their information from the Jewish media. They, the, they, these sources scour the Times daily, cherry-picking the negative articles about Jews and Israel particularly, and either offering an, offering an alternate opinion or presenting counterfacts that may be true or false or selective. Have you ever read an article or editorial in any of these sources that reflect poorly on the Jews of Israel? Of course not. Their, ad their advertisers would cancel their ads, not to mention the hit on their circulation. I once wrote a letter to the editor of the Jewish press asking why they did not cover the nursing home scandal that was all over the TV and the secular newspapers. Their response was, and I quote, we do not wash our dirty linen in public, followed by some advice as how Jews must do this and that and not publicize any negativity. And finally, they hear it from their rabbi or other Jewish leaders. Have you ever heard a rabbi or a Jewish leader criticize Israel? Of course not. Goodbye lifetime contract. And when they say that the New York Times is anti-Semitic, 
they get what amounts to a standing ovation. I've seen that. There's no question that the Jewish media and leaders all have an agenda. And that is to support and defend Israel against all criticisms from all sources, valid or not valid, employing whatever means necessary that will do the job. They are exactly like MSNBC and Fox News in this regard. Have you, have you ever seen MSNBC say a bad word about Biden? Have you ever seen Fox News say a bad word about Trump? Never. Yes, yes. <laughs> I want another test. <laughs> And what is the reason given by these accusers as to why the New York Times is biased against Israel and Jews? It's because they are anti-Semitic. You just heard that. And how do they know the Times is anti-Semitic? Because they're biased against the Jews and Israel. No other reason is offered. The reasoning does not provide any external evidence or independent support for either side of the argument. The beginning of the premise is also its conclusion. This type of analysis is called circular reasoning and it has no basis in, in logic. It's the same thing as saying the New York Times is anti-Semitic because they are anti-Semitic. A simple example would demonstrate the point. My son is tall because he is six foot two. And why is your son tall? Because he's six foot two. There's another reason why the Jewish media and leaders and the accusers want to, would want to discredit the Times, even if they agree that a particular negative story is 100% true. That is to show loyalty to Israel, right or wrong, no matter what. But maybe there's more here that meets the eye. How loyal were they when they strongly disagreed with Israel's policy? Think back to the Oslo Agreement. Did the Jewish media and the Jewish leaders speak out in support of, of the Israeli agenda then? Did the Orthodox community? You know the answer. You should remember the demonstrations with the banners reading, Rabin is a traitor. His entire government was viciously and continuously attacked in the Jewish media and by many of our leaders, which arguably, arguably, could have been a motivation for Rabin's assassination. What is unarguable is the glee that many of his distractors felt when he was gone from the scene. Even the rabbi of Mishul, of Mishul said he got what he deserved. Furthermore, you honestly think they will be loyal if a new government pursues a two-state solution? I cannot predict the future. But I would believe to bet my last dollar they will, that they will give them the rabbin treatment. So is it possible, even just a little, that this campaign against the Times is also part of a battle to keep the current government and its policies in power, Ooh. rather than turn it over to those with a different agenda? No. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Continuing, have you ever wondered why it's only the Times that is labeled anti-Semitic? And not any of the other media giants, such as the major news, major networks or newspapers, which cover the Israeli stories in much the same way. Let me offer an explanation. The Times has won 132 Pulitzer Prizes for excellence in journalism, by far the most of any publication. Not only is it universally recognized as the finest and most influential paper in the world, it also has a wide reach with nearly 10 million digital subscribers and growing the highest in the world by far, and a print run of 279,000, the second largest circulation of all the papers in this country. It is read by all the important people everywhere. It is quoted by all the media giants, except perhaps, perhaps Fox News, and therefore they are the target. Because of their agenda to protect Israel's positive mm -hmm. images, these, yes, some problem. these accusers <laughs> must say goodbye to the truth and fairness in order to diminish the paper's credibility. They are the ones who are biased. Now that we have identified the motivations of the Times distracted, let us examine if there's any truth to, to their accusation that the Times is anti-Semitic. I will not tackle the bias accusation since the topic of this debate is whether the new, whether Times is anti-Semitic or not, and not whether they are biased against Israel or not. Perhaps that will be the topic of a future debate. What do you say, Ray? First, we understand that a newspaper itself cannot be anti-Semitic. It is the people who actually run the paper and the people who generate the material that goes into the paper, the ones who do the actual work, they are the ones who you have to look at. For example, take the infamous Der Sturm, the quintessential anti-Semitic newspaper. Everybody, from the publisher down to the lowest copy boy, were anti-Semitic. Or take the newspaper Final Call, which is run by Louis Farrakhan. He is anti-Semitic, and so is his newspaper. Now let's look at the people who actually run the Times. 
Starting from the top, the publishers, the Salzburger family, all the past publishers were assimilated Jews. The current publisher is not Jewish by its Orthodox law, but everybody thinks he is. During the period from, during the period from World War II and, and today, the paper has been accused of being anti-Semitic. There is no evidence that they were called anti-Semitic before that. But why are they called? Because they buried the persecution of the Jews in Europe on the back pages before and during the war. An article in the Jerusalem Post, which I have handed out, offers an explanation as to why. They write that it was forced because, and I quote, the owners were so anxious for the paper not to be seen as a Jewish paper. The Post continues that when Arthur Oxelberg became publisher in 1963, the Times acknowledged its culpability and apologized, saying they were deeply sorry and called it unacceptable. The real word there, they were haunted by their, by their coverage. The entire Post article is in the handout in the front. It took a, uh, in addition, the New York Times today is not the same it was 80 years ago. Nevertheless, no, no matter how much time has elapsed, and no matter how many apologies are offered, and the charge does not go away, but rather is, kept, is, rather is continually kept alive by the Times detractors. As you just heard from Ed. The publisher oversees both the news side and the business side. So we should follow that if you are if you are anti-Semitic on the news side, you would also be the same on the business side. The, dispensing with the business side quickly, I worked on the business side for nearly 29 years from 1972 to 2001. There were many Jewish CEOs, vice presidents, CEOs, vice presidents, and directors. And during my tenure, we were all treated with respect and all our religious needs were accommodated. Never a problem. On the new side, let's look at the paper who produced the paper. Let's look at the people who produce the paper every day. The top job is executive editor, who determines the tone and tenor of the paper. He also assigns the length and the position of the important stories. If there's any anti-Semitism in the paper, it was definitely the result of his or her leadership. In the past 50 years, half of those holding this position were Jewish. One, the son of a reform rabbi, one a woman, a Jewish woman. And then two of the most respected names in the history of journalism, Abe Rosenthal and Max Franklin. I want to focus on Rosenthal, who held that position from 1977 through 1986. During his era, the Times was continually accused of being anti-Semitic, particularly during the war in Lebanon in 1982, known as Operation Peace of Galilee. It's too long a story to recount here, but because of my access to the archives, to New York Times archives at the time, I was able to prove to myself and to some of my contentious friends, some of them are here in this audience, that the charges were untrue. Catch me at the AZ pool and I'll tell you all about it. Now, skip forward a few years. Rosenthal had retired from his ex executive editor post, and he now wrote a two times a week column subtitle, On My Mind. The majority of his essays were pro-Israel, and he was lauded by the entire Jewish community in much the same way that Brett Stevens is lauded today. In reality, he was the same person he was before, but now he had the opportunity to express his own opinions, which are arguable. But when he was executive editor, a journalist through and through, he was presenting the facts, which are not arguable. Really not. Is this man, was this man, could this man be an anti-Semite? Now let us examine the other people who make the paper what it is. We are talking about hundreds of people here. The managing editors who hire all the personnel and collaborate with the executive editor. The news editor who is responsible for assuring that everything in the paper is fair and balanced and conforms to time style and usage. The correspondents, reporters, and analysts who write the raw copy and the researchers who support them. The desk editors who supervise the copy editors who edit the raw copy and write the headlines. The graphic editors photographers and picture editors and their supervisors who handle the graphics. And finally, the editorial page editor, who is responsible for the editorial, selecting guest contributors and reviewing op-ed articles. What type of person fills these jobs? Putting it mildly, to get a job at the New York Times is a very, very good for one's career. And only the cream of the crop are chosen. If any of them exhibits the slightest bit of bias, they are immediately disciplined or terminated. We witnessed that just yesterday. To think that all these dedicated and ambitious journalists, the best of the best anywhere, would endanger their careers by conspiring to distort the truth is beyond credulity. If that were remotely true, 
We have heard about it from many other sources over the years. All the tabloids love, all the tabloids love to gossip about the New York Times. I will conclude by picking on the columnist that has been vilified the most, Thomas Friedman. Uh, he is Jewish, of course, with a Jewish family, and the Chabad sister living in Ramat Bet Shemesh with her family. He became the Times bureau chief in Israel in 1984 and started his op ed column in 1995. He has won three Pulitzer Prizes. He is respected and welcomed by a vast number of movers and shakers all over the world, including Israel. Of all the columns on the op ed page, or more so, of all the people on the paper with a byline, he is the personification of the anti Semitism accusation we are debating here tonight. And why is that? Because he's very good at what he does. He criticizes Israel's actions and goals. He also criticizes the prime minister. He proposes solutions that are intolerable to what the vast majority of Orthodox Jews want, such as a two state solution and not leveling Gaza. Moreover, he expresses himself very well, quoting others, providing context, and making sense, at least to millions of Jews all over the world, including many in Israel. He is unquestionably Jewish, which means he cannot be called an anti-Semite. Therefore, another term has to be introduced, which is included in my list of abused words that convey an image. He is called a self-hating Jew. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say it again. He is called a self-hating Jew, and he is called a self-hating Jew, especially by Ed Goldberg, who never refers to Tom Friedman without uh, without adding on that self-hating Jew. The images that come to mind are Pablo Cristiani, Noam Chomsky, and George Soros. Ed never refers to Friedman without pointing out he's a self-hating Jew, whose opinions are therefore tainted. What I have never seen or heard from anybody are specific points that would, would belie Friedman's assertions or solutions. Never, not from Ed, from anybody. Therefore, his critics must rely on name calling, the last bastion of those who have no valid arguments. In conclusion, it's quite all right to disagree with the Times in their coverage, in their opinions, and in the management of their company. However, to even put them in the same category as the anti Semites we all recognize, the Crusaders, the pogrom and blood libel participators, and the murderous Nazis Yabak Shemam Vizikram, may their names be and memories be erased is a disgrace to our holy martyrs who are printed, who are holy martyrs who were victimized by the true anti-Semites. Lumping the New York Times together with those anti-Semites is over the top. Way, way, way over the top. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too often, people make no distinction between anti-Israel and anti-Semitic. Even the Lord of Ben Shapiro. It was a recent lecture entitled Anti-Semitism on campus, College Campuses when he characterized the protests as anti-Semitic, although many of the protests are Jewish and non-Muslim. The demonstrators were definitely anti-Israel, no question about it. And if they anti-Semitic, you can't keep those guys away. So why are they characterized as anti-Semitic? Because anti-Semitic has the zine that anti-Israel that anti doesn't have. Um, okay. Our participants have agreed. Uh, each will be giving given five minutes to either amplify what they said or to rebut what the other individual said. Yeah, you know, uh, Stanley said the New York Times has changed. You know, with the Holocaust, they they, they were anti-Semitic. Uh, they didn't mention Jews. It changed. You know, they've changed a lot. They hired this guy who said, I love Hitler. That was two years ago. What was his name? They hired, the, I said his name, I'll tell you afterwards. They hired this guy who said, uh, Israel is stuck with the, being an apartheid state disguised as a, as a democracy. Tom Friedman. They hired this guy who said, uh, Jew, uh, said that, um, Jews should he put his post uh, he put it in a, in a, in a Facebook a face, uh, picture of Hitler and said Hitler was 
right. They've changed terribly. Only they hired him two years ago. They changed by not admonishing that person that they hired who said, who wanted to know, they wanted to know, did they use baking soda when they cooked that Jewish baby? They've really changed, haven't they? Now, when that guy said that, the New York Times could have written an article saying, we admonish this individual. We think he was wrong. Not a word, not a word. Yesterday, the day before, they fired, they fired an Israeli journalist who put a like star in a Facebook, a Facebook article. He's an Israeli who said, uh, who said Hamas people should be killed. But they didn't hire, they didn't fire those other people. Hitler was right, baked the, oven, baked the, the Jewish baby in the oven. They didn't have, and for those people that are applauding here, shame on you. Shame on you. You'll be the first ones in the oven and in the train. Whoa. That's a little snail You have your five minutes. Are you done? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. So let me, let, me, let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you something. Uh, can you put I, I consulted a very high intellectual, Jewish intellectual, to say a few words about one of the articles. And if my wife gets it right, she'll say it, here it is. I can let me get it right in a minute. Yeah. Right. Yes, the New York Times has really changed, haven't they? The neighborhood was destroyed. My God. A few Palestinians, not Hamas people, were killed. My God. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that horrible? I'll conclude in, uh, with one very short statement. Folks, I am numb. I am numb by the Palestine, number of Palestinian protests, the frequency, the number of people, and the fact that the Times adds fire to the anti-Semitic view. I am numb by not by my kid who's going to college, who's going to college, and has to cross out those colleges, those colleges that are anti-Semitic, because he doesn't want to go there. I am numb by this debate that we're debating if the New York Times is talking anti Semitic. I am jealous of the people of color. The people of color, if you wore a mask that was a blackface 30 years ago, you are canceled. If you say an uh, anti black joke last week, you are canceled. You can't go in. You have, you're fired from your job, but you can say anything about Jews. You can say Hitler was right, and we'll say, well, that's not really anti-Semitic. You know, they changed a lot. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I am numb, numb at that. Time's up. One second, two seconds. I go back to, at the end of Tishbaugh, there's a song that we sing. And it talks about all the horrors. And at the end, we get uplifted. We get uplifted. Israel will come back. Israel will be rebuilt. I am numb, but I was uplifted. By how many people in this room wrote me emails, texts, called me, and said, make sure you say this about them. 
make sure you say that about them. I would have to wait. I'd have to talk about 12 hours to include what all of you said. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Yeah, why the problem Stanley. was right. And defend that. Defend that. I had no personal attacks. Well, we agreed. Well, we then we decided that we will not make personal attacks. I mean, if you want to, fine. Go ahead. I can take it. I can pull through. Are we okay? Yep. The first notice that I did not respond, did not rebut my speech but continued his 20 minutes with another five minutes. Why didn't he rebut my speech? Because he had absolutely nothing to say that was country. What are you shaking your head for? You're getting you nervous. Agree with it all. <laughs> that rebut my speech because, because he continued his 20 minutes. I knew Ed was going to do this. I knew he was going to talk to a lot of people who said a lot of things. I don't hear any of these guys. I don't know any of any of... The, the quotes, I don't know the context of the quotes. And I ask him very politely, Ed, like a defense attorney, and he's the prosecutor, tell me who these people are and I will research them. And maybe I can have an answer. It is impossible for me or anybody to verify all his remarks. I'm not saying they're not true, but I would like to see its context. We know context tells the whole story. So, uh, but he said no. And he said no That's emphatically. Right. He, and he, said, please, he said no emphatically. And like no I, interruptions. He said no emphatically. I didn't take the conversation, but he said no. And, it, and I asked him for it. He, he thought I was trying to uh, copy the test before it was issued. Okay. What he, let's, let's talk what he said. Uh, he, he, he accused, uh, he said anti Zionism is not, is, is, is anti Semitism and is anti Semitism. Well, remember back when the Reform Jews first, first started out, they were anti-Zionist. They certainly weren't anti-Semitic. They were victims of anti-Semitic. And take the Hasidim today. They're all anti-Zionist. Are they anti-Jewish? Uh, anti Anti-Israel, maybe, but not anti-Jewish. They're not anti-Semites. That's the point. Hasidim are anti-Zionist, but they're not anti-Semites. Now, please, please. I want the next question. You got it. Please. Let's talk about Toby Grossman. Let's talk about Toby Grossman because he brought that up. There's an article in Wikipedia. You can go look it up just after Toby Grossman. I have a copy of it right here. The Times and many other journals erred. And why did they err? Because uh, at the AP, which was the source of the story, erred. They, they, said, they thought they wrote in the, the wrong place. He was not a Palestinian. And they apologized. And how did they find out? Because Tobias' parents told them that was their son, a yeshiva book. The Times printed a correction, and the correction wasn't, the Times printed a correction, and that correction wasn't even whole because they got further information afterwards, so they printed a second correction. Yeah, wait one more minute. If you think the Times did it on purpose, then okay, that's, that's your thing. Also, the, the cartoon. The cartoon came to the New York Times on a Friday night, uh, Good Friday, in Paris. In Paris, please no interruptions. And was published without any consultation in the New York office, none. And it appeared not in the Times; it appeared in the International Herald Tribune. So, and it was taken out immediately when it was noticed. So, to say that it was published in the Times is wrong. To say that the Times personnel in New York had a place in it is wrong. And the Times did apologize. They were very embarrassed because, in truth, it was an anti-Semitic cartoon. Um, I have a lot of to say. I only have five minutes. You had more. Um, anyway, oh, as far as the anti-Semitism, uh, oh yeah. Stanley, time's up. Give me one more, one more minute. Gary Rosenblatt, who I think this is a handout, who is who used to be publisher of the Jewish Week, is a very large contributor to all Jewish magazines. He says, "Befoirish," in this article that I think was handed out. I still don't think that the New York Times is anti-Semitic. That is from Gary Rosenblatt. For anybody to come to contradict Gary Rosenblatt, you're crossing a big mountain. Gary Rosenblatt is a very, very good Jew and is very, very well known in, in, in the industry, uh, in, the, in the media. Industry. 
I have more to cut. I didn't realize he's talking. I had much more than five minutes of rebuttal. Stanley, please wrap it up. I'm okay. Done. Um, each please, I said, don't not attack any of the presenters. It's not right. I'm Israel Chai, as Bob would say. Let's all be together. All right, each of the uh, speakers now will be given another minute as they agree to. One minute of questions to go to One to two minutes, okay, to make any last comments they want. And Stanley, by agreement, will go first. I have no, I wasn't prepared for this. I have no additional comments to make, except to, oh, by the way, in case you were listening or have uh, uh, doubts of what I said, I did make a few copies of my speech. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to hand it out. I didn't want to hand it out. Are they uh, for sale, Stanley? No, no not for sale. I didn't want to hand it out before before the meeting because I didn't want you to read it before I was able to present it. But I do have 25, maybe 30 copies. If you want a copy afterwards, come over to me and I'll give it to you. If you run out of copies, leave me your email and I will send it to you electronic. I'm not ashamed of what I wrote. I'm proud of what I wrote. I would say it anywhere because it's true as proven that Talk that Ed had no rebuttal. He had nothing to say about it. Zero garnish charts about my about my speech. Okay. okay. Ed. So he mentioned Gary Rosenthal. Remember? Yeah. I don't want to quote him. I have been increasingly disturbed in the last two months by the Times coverage, news content, placement, photos, option, opinion pieces that lean more to the Palestinian narrative of victimization than to Israel's effort to defeat a terrorist enemy that seeks to murder Jews and destroy the state, and cynically uses its citizens as the human shields. You said, Rosenblatt, uh, that's my retort. It goes to me? Yes. Well, I so? Please, no. no. <laughs> he also said, gee, I didn't address what uh, he talked about. First of all, he wanted a copy of my debate. A copy. Never heard of that. You wanted a copy. I had, okay. I had no personal attacks. We agreed. Ed, your time is up anyhow. Okay. To the okay. last format. The, the point was the rebuttal. To the last format, we will take your questions. It can't be heard. The microphone is up here. Please come up so everybody can hear you. Please identify who you are, okay? And remember, questions only, no comments or attacks. Slide filler, basically, I love this. Yeah. Slide filler, basically, I'd like to thank those two gentlemen. Take the microphone, please. Slide filler, basically, I'd like to begin by thanking both presenters for their cogent and very well researched, documented presentation. Um, I came with. I came here to um, with an open mind, but with a very specific objective. I was hoping. Gosh, I have a question. There is. We're getting there. I was hoping that the presenters would help me understand how the IRA definition of anti-Semitism is being applied to the New York Times and its coverage, especially the latter part of the I IRA definition, which discusses the anti-Israel sentiments. So if you could address, this IRA, of course, um, amendment has been adopted by um, Congress and most major Jewish federations. So if you could help me synthesize what you've said with the IRA definition, I would find that most helpful. Who's Thank your you. question to, Stanley? Or well, I said both presenters. Thank you. I don't know anything about it. I have not prepared to answer that question. The IRA, the International I don't know Holocaust any, don't Remembrance I Alliance do not definition know of anti-Semitism. about it, and I'm not prepared to answer that question. I'm prepared. And you have a one-minute time limit to respond. Yeah, that uh, uh, 
group, by the way, or that the policy has been accepted by 36 states in over 50 countries and 1,100 major entities. They basically say, by using examples, that the saying that Israel no longer should exist is anti-Semitic. Saying Israel is being judged on two different levels, different than all the other nations, is anti-Semitic. That's what they said. They equated anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism as the same thing because nine of the examples they use linked Zionism, anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism. Nine of the eleven examples. Okay, all right. Wrap up so, so, so if Stanley does, it's very convenient that people don't read that. But if the United States Congress passes three hundred and eleven to fourteen, a regulation that says the United States okay, and the Zionism up. and anti-Semitism is the same, I believe it. Okay. Stanley wants his minute back. <laughs> Give it to you when it's back. The Times has never called for the destruction of Israel. The Times has very been supportive of Israel to continue to exist. And to, say, to suggest something other is simply not the truth. Right. Question. I really do have a very, very high Please take the microphone. Take the microphone. You have a high voice, but many of us are old here. Yeah. Standing. Who are you? My name is Sticky Spear. Okay. Lady Bird. I knew that, but God, okay. somebody else doesn't. You gave a wonderful, a wonderful defensive narrative about the New York Times. Question. Can you give us one positive story that the New York Times wrote about Israel that's definitive? One or two or three heard only a defense of them. Everybody can do that. Has anybody here ever read a story that's positive about the New York Times, positive about Israel in the New York Times? Show of hands. Your family. <laughs> <laughs> Your family. Well, family. Let, let, me, let me tell you, you know, I, I, my memory is the way it used to be, but they ran a beautiful, wonderful October 7th uh, article that even Ed Goldberg liked. And in fact, he compliments me. Finally, with New York Times has something positive. And they have biographies. And and they, and and if you talk about recently, they have a lot. I mean, I can't. I, I want to have no memory. Tell me questions that this. You think I'm going to go to research? I don't know the answer to that. I do remember that one. And I do remember many positive articles. I, I don't, I, I can't tell you chapter and verse. If you were telling me in advance that this question was being answered, I would look it up. I will not give you. I will not give you unverified uh, responses to that question because, frankly, that's the one I remember most. And Brett Stevens, of course. Stanley, wrap it up. Brett Stevens, and Brett, everybody loves Brett Stevens. So that's also another topic about the movie. Max Brandsdorf, for God, that'd be nice to start in the Islanders. Max, Okay, your question is for Stanley. I'm Max Branswell. A uh, couple things. I read the Times for 40 years till I finally threw up. Out. Okay, some of the some of the points I want to make. You're right. Some of this stuff is very subtle. For instance, I remember a story. Let me finish. Let me finish. I, I want I want to want you to explain. It. I want to explain to you. I saw no. I, there's a story about a, 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 a suicide bomber. Wait, story about a suicide bomber on the front page of the New York Times with the picture of the suicide bomber's mother. What do you think that message was? I don't know. Well, I know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Wait, when, when Tom Cotton does a uh, op-ed yeah. and the New York Times newsroom goes crazy about it, yeah. but when they give the platform to a Hamas mayor, to do an op-ed piece, what is that message? What's that message? Tom Cotton wrote an article with 
unverified, incorrect statements. In unverified. Unverified. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk unverified. It's the question. Come on. Right. Let's talk about unverified. The New York Times said Israel. No. It's not a debate. The New York Times requires proof, even in the other. They publish it. They publish it. That's why Bob Bennett got fired. I'm not saying that. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Arthur Horn in the back. Let's talk about. Let's talk about unverified. There's no question. There's only one question a person. Max, it's a big one. Bring it up at the pool. Arthur. Max, bring it up at the pool. We dive in the pool. Arthur. We swim in the same pool. I have, can you hear me okay? Two points I'd like to bring up. No, no, questions. Question. Two questions. Okay. My name is Arthur Horn. I live in Suffolk. <clears throat> in the winter time. Uh, point number one. Why is it that the New York Times had so much uh, so much information about uh, the fellow who uh, took away millions of dollars from people, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, Bernie Madoff, when he was transferred from one prison to another, it was on page one. When he went into the hospital, it was on page one. When they saw this house, well, it was on page one. Get to the question, please. Please get to the question. Why is it that important? All right. Yeah. Oh, wait, the second no, question. No, but the first question. My memory isn't that good. You can only say one question. Okay. Who remembers Bernie Madoff? Yeah. Was he the biggest criminal that was at that time? The biggest yeah. number one. I can use the word, a dirty word. I won't use that word. But was he a, a terrible person and it was covered in movies, in documentaries? Well, of every media, every. Just be quiet, please. I'm talking. Sipping, please. Just calm down. Come on, we're all, he we're was, all, we're he all sacred was, village people, here to, please. The Times is here to sell papers. Bernie Madoff was a major story, page one for sure. And if you think it wasn't on page one, then you're not a journalist. Be a journalist and understand what goes on page one. I don't know. I, as a referee, I don't know what that has to do with this. Please. The author. The second oh, question. No, no, no. It's one question a person. Don't tell me about Bernie Madoff. Please, I was one of his victims. Uh, the president's wife wants to draw. Identify yourself. I think I'm an example of middle America, average intelligence. Uh, I've been reading the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York uh, Post. For many, many years. And my question to you is, and my question to you is, um, when October 7th happened, and I was glued to each of the newspapers, I would see October 7th, the desecration of everything that was, you know, in, in, in Microphone the closer. Question, yeah, to your the, question, the question is, when you read about all the articles, you, the average middle America reads the titles, gets about the articles. What were the pictures that were depicted on the front pages of the New York Times every single day? I think they were children with the mothers. With the okay. okay. Well, let's talk about October 7th. The only the, the phrase that I got about the New York Times coverage on October 7th was unanimity. The New York Times did it. The New York Times covered that story well, and, and we could go over the articles. I have the archives to the articles. Please, let me answer the question. As far as afterwards, why are these pictures of these terrible suffering? Why is the destruction there all the time? Because it's news. It's news. I, I work at Russia an article. You know, I, I saw this. The past X amount of months, there were. Uh, uh, 10 stories about uh, Iran and 50 stories about Gaza. Well, there's nothing going on in Iran. There's no news coming out of Iran. That, that's the reason. And those pictures are dramatic. And they, I, I, I'm not here to, to quantify how many were, but those, when, when you're a photojournalist, 
Take a look at Vietnam. Take a look at all those pictures that tore your heart out. Those are the pictures that win awards. Those are the pictures that move people. And, and we have pictures of the Jews right. suffering. That's a show. Done. No, no, you're not done. Finish up. All right, okay. sawing and then kneeling. And stealing under the mask, right? I'll, I'll, I'll finish the answer at the pool. At the pool, I'll, I'll tell you. I can't. I have a one minute. One minute. One minute. Sorry. 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 How can you explain the fact that they constantly run articles on Jewish themes, on Jewish holidays, and 50% of the obituaries are about Jews? <laughs> Wait a minute. Some famous, and they not even not so famous. They run big articles about it. Last night they ran an article about Ben Stern, the Holocaust survivor. I never heard of it, but they ran a half a page. You know, you know, if you have to defend the New York Times that they're not anti Semitic, it's a great point to put in that they write a lot of Jewish obituaries. That is excellent. Thank you very much for making my yeah. point. I appreciate it. First Jewish or obituaries first is a show. Very, very nice. And you'll notice also that people in the Times have a tendency to die in alphabetical order. Yeah, <laughs> Neilan. Neilan Stern. Uh, okay, I'm from uh, Yarmouth. Uh, I just wanted to say, I wanted to ask Ed where he got most of the questions and articles that he's got listed there be because I spent almost 30 years working for ABC News. Ooh. And thank you. The fact is, anybody can say anything unless you put an attribution to it. You know, anyone could say, you wrote, you know, for instance, so and so, uh, Israel should be wiped off the map. But the question is, where, uh, before I get to the question, I just want to underscore, I want to underscore something Stanley said in the news business when uh, there's a saying, if it bleeds, it leads. The lead story is always something tragic or a terrible thing because that's what people want to hear. Now, getting back to Ed, uh, you're making all these statements. You want me to answer my question? Okay, you got all the okay, Neil, and, Neil and please. Okay. I want to keep this no, moving. Okay, let me talk. Okay. I went to the research in the internet, never taking, never taking one article that said something, but always looking for three sources, three different sources. The quotes that I quoted were, I researched and I looked at the articles where the quotes came from, the actual articles, okay? Never did I, did I use any of those quotes, not one, where there was only one Quote. Well, I researched. Research. Okay. Okay. Go after. Go look at Jewish. Jewish anti. Look at anti-Semitism of the New York Times, and you will have five thousand articles. Five thousand. Just hand up in the back. I can't see who it is. Okay. A fellow Marty. Saving time. <laughs> I take the point, so. I, I, I would really would appreciate that you don't walk behind me all the time. Uh, Martin Fish from uh, Rexford. So it's a little hard to put this as a question, but the implicate, if, let, let me just say, ask the question to Ed. If I said, if I believed it was my position that the present Israeli government was an embarrassment, that the United that Israel needing friends should abide by the Biden request. If I said to you that I felt that a lot of the settlement movements were wrong and endangering Israel, 
The implication of your statement beforehand is that people who do not agree with you, who do not take a right wing position, are I forgot the phrase that you uh, that you used, but it was enough for me to pop up and say that it was an embarrassment. It's sort of similar to a way. Morning, morning, I just let me say this. It was sort of similar. Please. It was sort of similar to a position that a few years ago that someone said to me, "If you voted for Obama, you're like the people who voted for Hitler." Okay. I mean, so, morning, morning, morning. So my question is that my question is why do you associate people being anti-Israel or anti-Semitic with their political position? And we both sh and we both share the same doctor. Okay, let me both. Uh, uh, let me both. No. Number one, let me both. Uh, first of all, I don't agree with everything the Israeli government does. I don't agree with everything, all the politics and the infighting in Israel. Name one. I, I don't Scary. agree with the fighting in the, around the judicial system. I don't agree with Netanyahu or a lot of things that he does. But, but. When 100% of the time I say what the paper says, they don't agree, they don't agree, they don't agree. And when anti-Zionism is flowing in the New York Times and every single op-ed piece that I've seen, every single one of them, when I am scared to look at the front page that people send me where pictures of, of that I mentioned before that are wrong, that are, is this a newspaper? Are they are they so sloppy in their reporting? Even when they corrected those two incidents about the hospital and about uh, correction about the uh, soldier, they got it wrong. They got it the second. They corrected a second time. Hey, drop it off. Anyway, you can be against Israel politics. Sure, you can be against uh, the United States politics, but if you're always always against everything that Israel stands, then you're anti-Zionist. I didn't get any questions from this side of the room. Anybody have any questions? I think we have done. I personally want to thank both Stanley and Ed. I know they prepared for this. We had a number of meetings to make sure everything went well and we Pretty much met expectations. Uh, didn't get too out of hand. 